Well, I'd like to join Sandy in thanking everybody for being here in a two-day program that I think is quite exciting at a time that I think is very important. Because as many of us know, the communities that we're looking at are still suffering. And in many of the communities are actually going in the wrong direction. Housing's played a central role in this crisis, the financial crisis that we've been living through, the economic crisis we've been living through for the last three or four years. And I think it's going to continue to do so. I want to pick up on a couple themes that uh, Sandy highlighted. One of the advantages of getting people from around the country to focus on this issue is that we can learn both from the successes that are occurring in some places, but also the failures. Because part of it is learning what not to do as well as what we should do in order to address this problem. The fact that the problem has gotten worse means we clearly haven't gotten all the solutions yet. And I think a second theme that comes from Sandy's remarks is I think there is some uniqueness to the various markets. Sandy's highlighted the Cleveland situation where they're facing a declining population. Well, a declining population with the demographics of Cleveland may recommend a certain type of solution that may be different than what we would use in New England where we don't have a declining population but have a series of other problems. And a New England solution might not be the right solution for San Diego that may be experiencing a growing population over time. So I think one of the important things that we're going to get out of this conference is that we do have to look at this in our unique markets and that one size may not fit all. We don't want to make the same mistakes. We want to learn from the successes of other regions. But we also want to think about what is the most appropriate tools that we want to bring to the markets that we're actually involved in. If you're at the edges, you may want to get so you can see the PowerPoint, because uh, I am going to follow through a, a PowerPoint. So when I was first asked by Richard and Prabal to participate in this conference, I sat back. The focus was REO. But I wanted to ask the question, is this a housing problem? Is this a foreclosure or REO problem? Or is this a community problem? And when I sat back and looked at the program and the agenda and the various nonprofit organizations that are involved today, I started by asking, what are the keywords in the names of the organizations participating in this conference? Because hopefully when you're a nonprofit organization, you're not randomly picking your name. You're picking your name because you actually want to talk about what your central mission is. Your central mission highlights to possible donors what it is you're going to focus on. It also highlights to the community you're serving what you're going to focus on. And it highlights to the people that are working for your organization what your central mission is. So I think we do learn something by the types of organizations. You also haven't been randomly selected to be on this program. You're on this program because we think you have interesting ideas for solutions. So what were the key words that came out when I looked at the organizations that were nonprofit on this program? Community or neighborhood for five organizations, housing for two, and foreclosure or REO one. I actually think that ranking seems about right in terms of how we should be thinking about our policy responses. But I would highlight that I'm not sure our policy dollars are going in that same order. And so that's something that I want to address as we talk through uh, the rest of this presentation and hopefully as we think about some of the solutions that are being proposed over the course of this morning. Now the reason that I started with that is I think how you frame the problem is really important. One of the things that we've learned from behavioral economics is if you don't ask the right question, you're not going to get the right answer. So let's start with my initial question. If it's a foreclosure problem, what kind of solutions am I going to be looking for for a foreclosure or an ARIO problem? Well, the types of problems that I'm probably going to be looking at are going to be more legalistic in their framework. I'm going to be asking, how does the bankruptcy code work? How does the foreclosure process work? What can I do to mitigate the foreclosure problem? So that question centralizes a certain set of answers. If I think it's a housing problem, I may address it in a different way. I may ask, what is a sustainable financing model? Am I worried about predatory lending? Am I worried about underwriting standards? Am I worried about getting education to people that are going to be first-time home buyers? I'm going to be asking myself, what is sustainable home ownership? What does that mean, and how do I make that happen? 
If instead I say it's a community problem, then I may be wanting to take a more holistic approach. One size may not fit all, but I need to think about it in the context of the problems that are facing that community. For that, I may want to have more flexible financing. I may, may want to have revenue sharing at the state or at the federal level. And I may want to focus on those communities that have been most affected, that have clusters of REO problems, but more than likely, at least in New England, have clusters of other problems as well. Now clearly, all three of those are part of the problem. This is a foreclosure problem and an REO problem. This is a housing problem, and this is a community problem. So how do we think about the right way to allocate our resources, given that you might come up with different solutions depending on how you frame the question? And so I'm going to talk a little bit more about whether we're putting the appropriate funding into thinking about community. Many of your names highlight that you're looking for a community solution. You may be dealing with a housing problem and a foreclosure problem, but you're also thinking about a community problem. So how should we think about funding that, and how should we be thinking about community solutions? So as I ask that question, uh, Prabal and Richard know that whenever they ask me to speak, I start asking for data. And it tends to moderate how many times I get asked to, to speak as a result, which has some positive attributes to it. Um, but I think it is useful to actually look at the data. And I'm going to be looking at some of the data from New England. So this first chart looks at two things. It looks at the change in housing prices from 2005 to 2008, and it looks at the real estate owned per square mile. Now, if what I do is I just look, if you block off with my body here, uh, form below, you can see that the circles that are empty in the middle are not particularly correlated. If instead I block it out and do the ones that are four or more ARIO that are the circles that are fully filled in, you can see that it actually fits the data reasonably well. Now this is a correlation, not a causation. And what it does highlight is those communities that have much more REO per square mile also have been communities that have had very substantial declines in housing prices. Now we don't know if that's because the communities already had a lot of difficulties, and REO is symptomatic of that, or whether REO actually contributes to the problem and makes that situation worse and actually makes the prices decline. I think, unfortunately, we're getting enough panel data now that we can start addressing that. That's one of the things I'm encouraging uh, both my community affairs and research department to kind of think about this correlation a little bit more and get a better understanding of what the interaction is and which way the arrows go and what that implies for potential solutions. Now the reason you'd worry about the causation is in, at least in New England, those places that have four or more REOs per square mile actually have a lot of other problems as well. So this first slide documents some of those other problems. For communities that have four or more REOs per square mile, they have a lot more property crime, they have a lot more low weight births, they have higher unemployment rates, and they have declines in small businesses with nine or fewer employees relative to those other communities. So there is a difference between these communities. These aren't randomly picked communities. And it does highlight that you're not only dealing with an REO problem, you're dealing with other problems in many of these communities. This provides a couple more indicators. If you look at the top, uh, it looks at education. The reason I want to highlight education is I think something that's sometimes lost in this debate, and as I was reading through uh, the various papers, children are very rarely mentioned in many of our papers. But children are one of the main aspects of the collateral damage that's occurred through this foreclosure problem, and I think it's something that we actually need to have more attention to. So if you look at the communities, and again, uh, for this data, I would highlight both in the previous data and this data, it's looking at what was happening prior to this crisis occurring. So this isn't after the crisis or during the crisis, the time period is before the crisis. And you can see that the high school dropout rate was far greater for those areas that had four or more REOs eventually relative to those that had less. And the students that failed the Massachusetts statewide standardized math test were much higher. 
Now, it's not surprising at all to me that children are actually a central part of the problem. There's been a lot of sociological studies that have highlighted that, peop that children that have to move frequently frequently also have educational issues keeping up. Well, the one thing that a foreclosure is, is a movement of a house. It may be a movement to another school. It may be a movement to a homeless shelter. It may be a movement to the back seat of a car. It is very difficult for somebody in that kind of environment to be able to keep up educationally. That means it's a problem not only for that year, but it's potentially a permanent effect for those children in those communities. So I think it's important for us to get a better understanding of some of the collateral damage that's occurring through this crisis and how it affects our children, how it affects our communities more broadly. If you look at that bottom uh, chart, what this looks at is the fiscal gap, and we're looking at state revenue sharing in the state of Massachusetts. My guess it's not unique to Massachusetts, but we've done a study at the Boston Fed, and what we've looked at is the needs of communities compared to their ability to raise funds in those communities. And when we, that's what we're calling the fiscal gap. And what a study in the Boston Fed showed was that those communities that had the most need and the least capacity were not getting their fair share of the financing from the state. My guess is it's not unique to Massachusetts. Many of our revenue sharing formulas don't get at where the sources of the problem are. And it may highlight that our federal dollars may not be spent in the right way to get to the right communities, something else that I think we have to address over time. And you can see that the fiscal gap between those with four more REOs is much, much greater than those communities with less than four REOs. So next I want to go through a series of charts. I'm going to go through them very quickly since we're uh, short on time. But I think they'll give you a visual image of what's happening in these communities. So this first chart looks at where are the concentration of REO properties. Blue is bad, green is good. If someone wants to sell you waterfront property in Boston, or the Boston area, this highlights that you might ask a few more questions. Uh, because clearly those waterfront properties are in areas that have four or more REOs. So just as you think of this image, let me go through some of the other problems that are affecting these communities. So this is prevalence of crime. You see many of the same communities highlighted. You look at high school dropout rate, it's many of the same communities affected. You look at percent of students who failed statewide standardized math tests, many of the same communities affected. Look at the fiscal gap. So those others were looking at the needs in many of those communities. These communities are not getting their fair share of municipal revenues from the state. So it just highlights that we're not getting our dollars in the right place to really address this problem, and it is a very, very severe problem. So some observations on policy and research. Clusters of REO do seem to be associated with depressed home prices. Areas that have four or more REO also have a host of other community problems. We have to understand what the correlation tells us, what the causation is. I think that causality is an important research topic. It's also an important topic for understanding how we spend our policy dollars. But I think it also highlights that in many of our communities, and this is only using New England data, so it could be different than Cleveland data, we need a more holistic approach. If you deal with this as just a housing or foreclosure problem, but you don't deal with the crime, you don't deal with the schools, you don't deal with the, all the other problems that these communities are facing, you're not likely to be solving the problem because the foreclosure problem and the REO problem may be a symptom of other problems in that community. So I think we need more funding for, hol for holistic solutions. That may imply more revenue sharing in a way that gets the money to the affected communities that most need it. I think we need more research, such as the research that the Cleveland Fed is doing, on what are holistic solutions that work. It's much easier to send dollars towards a foreclosure problem or a housing problem. If it's a community problem, that's not as easy to solve. But it does say that different communities may want to have different solutions. Some communities may want to focus on public safety as the primary concern that's affecting their community. Others might want to focus on schools. 
Others might want to focus on declining populations and vacant properties. I don't think one size fits all. Many of our public policies are a one size fit all right now. So we need to find a way to tailor our spending to the kinds of problems that we're facing. As I've highlighted in this talk, I think at least in Massachusetts, there's a lot of question about whether we're getting the funding to those communities that most need it and have the least capacity to address this problem. Ongoing research at the Boston Fed is going to be looking at some of the collateral problems that are occurring from this crisis, including the problems for our children that may have a more permanent impact. So that's some of the things that I've been thinking about. I'm looking forward to hearing about some of the solutions that we're hearing from around the country in the panels over the course of today. I think this is a very exciting time. This is a very important time to be working on these set of problems. So I look forward to talking with you over the course of the rest of the day. Thank you.